All righty. Welcome, everybody, to Parent Helping Parents a webinar on parenting during a pandemic. For those of you who are new to PHP, we are an agency that supports families who are raising children with special needs, whether it's attention challenges or learning differences, mental health challenges, intellectual disabilities. We serve all disabilities. Um, and uh, I, like many of you, have been telecommuting this week and supervising an 11 and 13 year old who are um, also working from home this week as during the school closure. So look, looking forward to hearing what Dr. Korb has to share tonight. Uh, we're gonna be holding weekly online webinars as well as online support and information groups throughout this crisis. If you would like to um, hear about our upcoming ones, you can send an email to info at php.com. Again, that's info at php.com, and we will send you a weekly COVID-19 updates uh, for other speakers. Or you can follow us on social media, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to hear um, about other resources for you in your parenting. And now, without further ado, let me introduce you to Dr. Korb, who is a developmental pediatrician and director for Center for the Developing Minds. He's also recently published a book called Raising an Organized Child, and he is a father of five. So welcome, Dr. Korb, and we're looking forward to your presentation on parenting during a pandemic. Thank you very much. I appreciate everyone for spending their evening with us tonight. You know, there's a lot of things on all of our plates and a lot of worries in our mind. And uh, I appreciate um, you being here. And I hope I can give you a little peace of mind um, through this presentation tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about parenting. And I fully recognize that um, we're in the middle of something that is potentially big. We don't know how big and, and we don't know how severe, but there's potential for this to be big. And so while we're going to talk about parenting, I want to recognize that you know, health comes first and safety comes first and the safety of your loved ones is the most important uh, things. And even though we're not talking about that tonight, um, those things uh, need to be taken first. And I'm sure you already have. Um, we're all sheltered in place and we're taking care of ourselves. Once that's done though, now we got to talk about how we're going to get through the next few weeks. Uh, and that's where parenting comes in and becomes, becomes very important. Um, this has been an unprecedented change to our lives. We've never had a, a time where we've been shut in our house for weeks. And uh, it, it's going to take a, a thoughtful approach to parenting in order for us to be prepared. The other thing I want to talk about is when everybody is cooped, in, uh, cooped up in the house, there's tensions can get high. Uh, parents have to get work done. They need their kids to be quiet. It can be stressful. I want to just take a moment to talk about domestic violence. If, if at any point you feel unsafe in your home, call and get help. It's critical. Uh, if you have guns in your house, now's the time to lock them up. And I hate to bring up such morbid and sad things, but the reality is, is during times of crisis, domestic violence increases, and I want everybody to be safe. So now let's move on to what we're talking about. I'm going to give you a quick overview of, of, of the virus. Um, so that when you talk to your kids, you can have factual information. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how to talk to your kids and about the virus. And then I'm going to spend most of our time talking about how to keep your house uh, in order and organized so that life can move more smoothly or as smoothly as possible. Hold on, I'm having trouble advancing my slide. There you go. Um, so. Dad, what is a coronavirus? That's what you'll hear from your kids, or that's what I'll hear from my kids. Um, Dad, what is a coronavirus? This is what we know, and we don't know everything, and that's the reason this is kind of scary, is because this is a new virus, and we don't know exactly how it functions, but we're learning about it quickly. This virus popped up in December. Uh, it quickly spread throughout the world, and it's in most countries at this point. Um, how it presents, when people catch it, there's a big range. Some people, get very sick and some people uh, don't. There have been people who've died from this um, disease. We know that younger children are less severely affected than older people. Older people seem to be most at risk. We know that people who are symptomatic with the virus tend to have fevers and coughs, a dry cough and shortness of breath. Um, and, and 
since the elderly people get sick, and we're talking about kids here today, uh, it's important for our kids to know that this isn't just about them, but it's about the community. And, and how do we keep our community safe? And the tricky part is young kids don't really understand thinking about things other than themselves. They're, they're somewhat egocentric. So we're going to talk about what you're going to say to your kids in a little bit. Uh, kids want answers. And if your child is four years old, I'm sure that they've heard about what's going on with this virus. And, um, and uh, they may not understand it. And I would hope that, and I'm sure you all would hope, that when your kids do hear about scary and big things, what they need to do is, is, um, is, is hear it from you. They need to hear from their parents what the truth is and what the reality is. And there's some, some tips I can give you. One is uh, ask them what they know before you start talking. Because the most important thing is to clear, clear up misconceptions. It's very easy for them to develop. I've had little kids this week tell me uh, that they heard that this kills you while you're asleep. I've heard kids tell me that I can only get it if somebody coughs directly on my, on my face. I've heard other people say that uh, if I wash my hands, I can't get it. And, and you want to listen to them and hear what they know and then give them the facts. Give them truthful facts. Make it simple and, and doesn't have to be overly scary, but share the facts with them. Tell them what, they, what you know. And when you don't know all the answers, it's okay to say, I don't know. Why don't we go look it up? Um, but what I like to say is that if this is a germ that people can cough or sneeze or breathe, breathe, and it can live on surfaces for at least 24 hours. And, um, and if they ask you, have people died? It's okay to say, yes, people have died. Um, but I don't know how many. And uh, too many, though, have died. And we're going to do what we can to, to make um, everybody safe. You give reassurance. It's important to offer simple reassurance. So not just say we're going to do things to keep people safe, but what, what are we going to do and who's doing what? And you can reassure them that the best researchers and the best doctors right now are, are working on this to make sure that we have a plan to keep everybody safe and to get over this disease as quickly as possible. Um, watch for your child's anxiety. Pay attention for the, the signs. When kids get anxious, sometimes they get irritable. Sometimes they get emotional. Sometimes they get very clingy. Sometimes they have trouble falling asleep. And you know your child. Comfort them. Give this, be extra patient with them during this time. And be comforting and supportive. Monitor their media exposures. There's so much 24-hour news out there with negative, dangerous, complaining, angry things going on that we need to control that as much as possible. Um, in fact, uh, it, be careful what you talk about. Uh, if what you're doing is complaining about the government and, and what they're not doing, it's bringing up more anxiety about uncertainty. Stick to what we know. Stick to this is what the doctor's doing. This is what the research is doing. This is what our mayor is doing. This is what our county is doing. And what's being effective and, and uh, the things that will keep them safe. And give them control. That's really important. So this is what you can do to keep safe. If you wash your hands every time you come in contact with something outside of our house, you'll be, you'll be the most safe. Um, if you wash your hands while singing a song, and you can let them have control of what song they want to sing while washing their hands, we'll have more time to get the germs off of our hands. Give them control over the situation and let them know uh, what they can do. Um, to, to be safe, cough into their sleep, uh, wash their hands, uh, make sure they get enough sleep, do these things to, to keep themselves healthy. So when you're explaining what's going on, you have to do it at your child's level. And remember that I said that kids who are very young are egocentric, which means they only see things through their own perspective. So if they're only seeing things through their own perspective, they're really less worried about their community or their grandparents. They're, they're really worried about themselves. And that's the level for a very young child you're going to talk about. You're going to be accurate. You try not to be vague. If you say something, far, something happened in a faraway town and some people got sick, 
that's kind of too vague because I'm sure they've heard stories about other things. But but you can be um, more specific. Yes, there was something that happened in a, that started in a city called Wuhan, China, and there's a cold. It's called the coronavirus that can make people very sick. It has spread to countries all over the world, including ours. One good thing is that kids who get it can only get a little sick, and that the doctors are learning more and more about it every day, so we can prevent it from spreading. Um, that's giving reassurance and explain to them that there's things that we can do to keep ourselves safe. Now, when you're talking to um, kids with developmental di disabilities, kids who might be 14 or 15, but have a cognitive level of five or six, remember that when you're giving your explanation, you have to do it at their developmentally appropriate level and not their chronological age. So speaking to your 14-year-old like a five-year-old, if cognitively that's where they're, they're at, is important. Um, if your child has autism, there's things that you should think about. When somebody has autism, um, they may not get comfort the same way somebody without autism does. Again, you know your child, you know what comforts your child. Uh, a hug and cuddling may not be as useful for some kids with autism uh, as it might be for some kids without autism. But whatever does comfort your child when they're feeling stressed, allow them to do those things that are comforting. Um, the other thing you should know is that children with autism tend to be very black and white in their thinking. So be specific, try not to be vague. Instead of saying we need to wash our hands a lot, say we need to wash our hands uh, every time we touch another person or doors outside of our house. You can be as specific as you want with them because uh, they do really well with rules and structure and, and specifics. Um, so let's talk now about, whoops, how do I do this? Hold on one second, let me get you back. So, come on slide, there we go. Um, at your house, I think you've already done this, but just in case, be prepared. Think about the essentials. Everybody's talking about toilet paper, but food's also important. Uh, diapers, sanitary products, medicines. You want to make sure that you have an ample supply of medicine if you're not going to be going in and out of your house. And now let's talk about what we're here to talk about tonight. Let's talk about parenting. Now that we got some of the nuts and bolts out of the way, the first thing I want to talk about is routines. When, when there's things that are uncertain, when there's chaos like this and when there's change, um, people struggle. They struggle with their behavior. They struggle with their anxiety. And so the more structure that we can keep into our children's lives, the more effectively we're going to get through these next few weeks. Children in general have pretty structured lives. They get up in the morning, they get dressed, they brush their teeth, they have breakfast, they go to school. At school, they, they learn, and they take a break, and they learn, and then they have lunch, and they learn, and they go home. And um, if they're a little older when they're at school, they move from class to class to class in a structured order. They come home, they have a snack, they do a little homework, they then have some free time or do some after-school activity, they have dinner, they start getting ready for bed, and we go to bed. That's a lot of structure. And if all of a sudden they're home and that structure disappears, there's a lot of opportunity for chaos. So one of the things, the first thing I recommend is keeping structure. So thinking about that, what can you do? You can get up at a set time. You can have meals at set times. You can schedule in some time for learning activities, whether it's the online program that your school may be setting up or other learning activities that you can uh, implement for your child. You can have time for creative and imaginative play scheduled in there. You can have free time scheduled in there. You can have cleanup time scheduled in there. You can have time for exercise uh, and outlets to blow off some steam. Uh, all these things, bedtimes, need to maintain consistency so that kids know what to expect. Let's see. Let's go again. So the first thing we do in our routine is we keep learning constant. Keep learning constant. Um, and so what I mean is read books, give them the opportunity to sit and read. They can do their online education programs. They can do homework if they have it. 
there's so many opportunities to learn online right now. The um, There's virtual tours of museums that are offered. There's virtual tours of zoos. Google Earth has 31 national parks that you can take tours of um, on the internet. I, the New York Public Library has 3,000 books that you can download and read for free. The uh, Mo Wellms, I don't know if you're familiar with him, but no, Mo Wellms uh, is the author of Nuffle Bunny and Don't Let the Pigeon Drive the Bus. He's offering on, on YouTube classes every day at, at one o'clock on how to draw. And so you can go and look up the ones he's done already on YouTube and take, give your kids drawing lessons. Be creative. There's lots of opportunities to, to learn, not just Khan Academy, which is fantastic and really great for the older kids, but there's, there's opportunities to learn for young kids. Um, make, sure that, make sure that those are, are in your routine, in your schedule. Oh, and you know the other thing I would say with that is parents helping parents on their Facebook page. If you go to their Facebook page, they've been putting out wonderful uh, links to programs that are great for, for learning. So go to their Facebook page and, and follow what they're doing too. Provide outlets. Kids need outlets. They need to have the opportunity to exercise and to be creative. They need the opportunity to be artistic. Uh, those things are, are very important. How do you exercise if you're cooped up in your house? That gets tricky, right? But there's certainly opportunities. I mean, think about the people in the parks that do Tai Chi. It would be easy to do Tai Chi. And those people always look very trim and very fit. Uh, so there's things like Tai Chi that you can do. I, with little kids, I like to hit a balloon up in the air and, and let, see how many times they can keep it up and down. I like to encourage what I call the COVID challenge. Anybody, Anytime anybody the house mentions a virus or uh, the corona or COVID, everybody does five push-ups. We all get either really strong or we learn to not be worried and talking about the virus all day long. Get it out of our mind and not obsess ourselves with it. Um, in our house, I do something called survivor challenges, or I used to do this more when my kids were little, where I would say, I need you. Your mission is, if you, if you choose to accept it, is to get my slippers in my bedroom but you have to get there by only stepping on these two pillows. Or I want you to sneak and touch your mom on her knee, but you have to touch a wall your whole way that you're getting there. Give them the opportunity to move and wiggle and play. Give them the opportunity to be imaginative and pretend. It's a great way to exercise their mind and to give an outlet for their for children. Um, encourage puppet shows and, and have tea Pretend to be doctors. Uh, it's important to do that imaginative pretend play. Let them do art. It's another great outlet. And they're going to make messes. But that's okay because you've built cleanup into your schedule. So you don't have to worry about the messes they're going to make. Messes happen. <laughs> but if we expect them, uh, that's my demonstration of how to cough into your elbow. If we expect them, then, um, then we, can, uh, we can cope with them when they happen. But be cautious about electronics. because. Electronics are not a good way to blow off steam. Um, kids like doing them, but have you ever had your kid come on, I mean, play electronics for a while and feel more relaxed? I find when kids get off electronics for a long time, they're more stressed. It isn't really an outlet, it's a pastime. And it doesn't mean they can't do electronics, but don't fool yourself to thinking that that's an outlet. Outlets are ways to blow off steam, to relax, and to um, comfort ourselves. Now, as far as I know, most cities haven't had quarantines that prevent you from going outside. And unless you live in a real crowded area where you're going to come in contact with people, perhaps if you lived in New York City, um, you, you, you can go outside and get exercise. And your kids will need this. Um, if, you live, if you're lucky enough to live near, um, near nature, go out and take hikes. Let your kids ride their bikes. If you live in a safe neighborhood, play catch in your street um, or, or on your lawn if you have one. And then remember that your pets need exercise too. So it's a great opportunity to get the kids out to just say, let's go play with the dog and run around with the dog. Get outside with your kids. They need it. But be careful not to spend too much time on playgrounds because other kids are crawling on those playgrounds and there's germs. Now is not the time to go to McDonald's Playland or to uh, Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, you want to get outside and you want to play, but you don't want to play with things that everybody else is playing with. 
And it's important to maintain your rules and your limits. Rules and your limits. You know, when when you heard you were going to be kept home for a few weeks, um, that you were going to shelter inside, that uh, shelter in place, you thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do with my kids for a few weeks? And your kids thought, woohoo, I'm going on the couch and I'm going to watch uh, play games all day and watch TV and it's going to be the best vacation ever. Uh, and what happens then is if they set their expectation that way and you allow them to run with that expectation, um, they're going to be really disappointed when your expectations don't match their expectations. So right away, set those rules and set those limits. And, and really, they should be the same limits that you've already had in place. We're going to have a bedtime. We're going to have a, a, a wake-up time. We're going to do meals at our regular time. And it's nice because now that most of you are home, there's going to be opportunities for the families to eat meals together. Um, we're going to have the same limits on electronics that we always have. It's okay to use electronics if your child is old enough. In fact, I like to, to refer to the American Academy of Pediatrics recommendations to say kids less than two really don't need to be on electronics. Kids less than five, it's minimal and it's educational only. Um, and if it's over five, no more than two hours a day of electronics. And that means TV and game devices and iPads and phones total. That's what they get at, at most. Now, two hours is a lot. Um, and, and I see kids do a lot more than that. Uh, but it's not, it's not a productive use of their brain time. It's mental time. It's eating screen is the list. But if we ate it all day, our bodies and our health would be a mess. And that's, that's the same thing that we do with this, is we use everything judiciously. Um, electronics have limits. So set those limits. Now, with kids, when kids get older, you can continue to set limits. Um, and your kids will complain about them because that's what they, they do. I, I, uh, I like to use the analogy of riding a roller coaster. When you get into a roller coaster, you need to you pull that safety bar down. And then the next thing everybody does is they shake that safety bar to make sure it's going to be there. And that's the same thing you are supposed to do. When you uh, set a rule or a limit, they're going to shake it to see if you're going to be consistent. And your job is to show them that you're always going to be there with those rules and those boundaries and those consistent limits. Um, so, so set your limits. For teens, we, I like to help them understand it by, by talking about the need to do's and the want to do's. There's need to's and there's want to's. And as long as the need to's are getting done, I don't worry too much about the want to's. The need to's are things like their health and their hygiene and their homework and their household chores. Uh, their homework could be their online learning. Those things have to happen. So health, exercise, sleep, nutrition, uh, hygiene. They got to put on deodorant. They got to take showers regularly. They need to brush their teeth. They need to do some help around the house and you can make it clear what those things are. And they need to they need to do some learning, some education, some ongoing cognitive thought. Um, those things are the non-negotiables. Those things have to happen. And as long as those things are happening, parents don't get too worried about whether or not their children are doing the want tos. It's the need tos that have to come first. So if they want to play electronics, that's okay. We got to make sure our need tos are done. And and that's the limit that you can use when you're cooped up at home, but you can continue to use it when your kids go back to school. Again, need tos over want tos. And, and one of the things I love about this is you are no longer making the argument about too much electronics. You're making your argument about the things you need to do. And it's hard for any kid to argue that they shouldn't be taking care of their health or their hygiene or helping out around the house, because those are things that we just, we just need to do. Use this as an opportunity. Everybody's home. You've got time. Use this as an opportunity to teach life skills to your kids. So this is teach your kids to wash their car. Oh, wash your car. Probably not their car. Teach your kids to uh, sow. If you have a yard, now's the time to plant a garden. It's the right season to start planting. Um, let your kids uh, learn how to do laundry. That's another great thing that they can do. These are skills that um, you shouldn't think of it as punishment. These are things that they're going to need to do to launch into adulthood. So teaching them these life skills 
are important. Teach them how to build a fort, to do a makeover of their closet, to give a haircut, to put on makeup. Teach these life skills that that whatever they are that you value in your family, now is an opportunity to do it. Um, oh, and one of the most important life school skills is to deal with boredom. So while I'm advocating for using routines and schedules, I'm also advocating to have free time built into those schedules. And you want kids to learn to think of things to do, to solve the problem and not to rely on you to solve their boredom. So don't be afraid if they get bored and they complain a little bit. One of the nice things about having your routines is that they know that this boredom only exists till the next activity is scheduled. Whereas if you give them run of the, um, the mill, if you give them free time, uh, then when they feel bored, it's going to go on forever because they don't see an end to it. So you've protected them a little bit by giving them a routine and schedule, but also give them the opportunity to be bored. It's one of the most valuable life skills that kids have. It teaches them to build drop down menus of their, in their brain of things I want to do later so that they can remember it when the time is, when the time is right. And that kind of organizational thinking. And it's an opportunity to connect to the family. And I know in some families it's tricky. I know in some families uh, parents need to be getting work done during the day. And, and so they don't have the luxury of, of um, being there for their kids all the time. But as you build your schedule, think about how you can sync up your lives with your child. So for example, don't stay up really late and then sleep in when your child is up. Sync your sleep habits to theirs. Uh, maybe you need an hour or two of less sleep. Good. There's an hour or two of time that you can get stuff you really need to get done once your kids go to sleep. Um, when your child is quiet doing cognitive work, get some of your work done. If you only have limited time to spend with your child, put it in the schedule and say, this is when I'm available for you to ask me questions. This is when I'm available to play with you so that they have a real clear sense of what those expectations are, but allow yourself um, to have those times. Again, one of the nice things is that we're home together and we can eat meals together. Make sure you make an effort to eat at the same time. Uh, use these as opportunities to connect. And connect with your family that isn't staying with you. It's an opportunity to FaceTime with your parents and with your aunts and with your uncles. Just check in with everybody, see how everybody's doing. Show your kids the value of community and how community looks out for each other. Um, so use this time to connect with your family. I want everybody to remember that the goal here is not just to survive this break, but it's to thrive during this break. So if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling overwhelmed, be sure to turn off your electronics. Be sure to turn off your media. Don't have CNN or Fox News or whatever you're listening to going on in the background all day. Your kids don't need it, and it's not good for you. If you want to be updated, read an article that you like or set a schedule a time where I'm going to catch myself up to the news for 15 minutes every evening. But, but try not to be watching this constant ticker of news to help you relax instead, uh, or to help, you, to help you relax, try not to be watching the constant uh, flow of news. Instead, focus on the moment. Be mindful. Being mindful means think about the things right now that I can smell, and that I can hear, and that I can taste, and that I can feel, and that I can see. Those things are real, and those things are important. And those things will bring you back to the moment and help you to be calm. Also, I recommend um, to focus on things that are in your control. And what is in your control are your rules and your limits and the things that go on in your household with your family. Try to keep those things in mind. That's where your focus should be. Um, try to find, the in this pandemic, try to find the positive parts. There are real opportunities for families to come together during this time. Uh, this is an unusual moment. But keep your family together with consistent plans and routines. Uh, this unpredictable um, situation will be much more manageable if you can do that. So what I want, what I want to do now is I want to you know, bring Marley onto this call, back onto this call. She's going to ask some of the questions that you've been um, graciously uh, 
putting down. And, and whenever we do this, it's wonderful opportunity because the whole community benefits from your questions. So I appreciate you sharing those questions. Marley, why don't you ask them and I'll do my best to answer as many as we oh, can. Okay, and I'm sorry, uh, Dr. Corb, you probably didn't notice it, but there's been some feedback and some audio trouble. So just for people who are listening, we there's really nothing we can do about that. So um, I'll just watch the chat. Just tell us if you continue to have problems. Our first question, what are ways to boost our children's health and immune systems during this time? So uh, the most important thing is sleep. The most important thing you can do to boost your immune system is, is sleep. The second thing you can do is you can avoid exposures. So washing your hands and soap works as well as anything else. Um, those are the most important things. It, I've seen lots of um, information out there about vitamin Cs and and other vitamins. And really, if your child has a, a healthy diet, you should be okay. You shouldn't need additional supplements. Um, I, re I recommend hand washing and, and sleep and exercise. Okay, great. Um, so one question is, so going out for a walk is okay? Is the, the risk here is being in contact with people or things that people are touching. But if you're going for a walk and you don't live in a crowded area, it should be absolutely fine. Okay. How about besides FaceTiming with friends, do you have any other suggestions for supporting our children's social isolation? So, um, uh, this is a tricky thing. And, and that's one of the reasons why we need to learn to play with our kids um, and engage with our kids uh, because kids can thrive like that. They, you know, as far as the opportunities, sure, there's FaceTime, there's Skyping with friends, there's those, those kind of social talking. Um, for those kids that do play games, a lot of the games are somewhat social and they, they game with each other and they can do that interactively. Um, there are communities out there like Club Penguin and different things where there's other kids that can interact with other kids in, in, in different games. Uh, so uh, you're right. The opportunity is is more difficult, but I would avoid play dates because I don't think that's the right thing for the community right now. Okay, here's one. I'm sure a lot of us with two people working at home, the whole family's there. This one says, my kid's father and I are not al aligned about this. He's not concerned enough and I'm a bit too much and kids are getting mixed info. How can we both be on the same page? So, um, my, my, my aunt tells this story about my grandparents. She said, anytime my grandparents used to disagree, they would get up, they'd walk into their bedroom, and when they would come out, they'd agree. I don't know what happened in the bedroom, nobody knows, but they would come out and they were in agreement. And that's important when you're, when you're sending messages to your kids that you guys are sending the same message. It's, it's critical. Now, uh, the reality is, is nobody knows. If dad thinks this isn't serious, he doesn't know. And if mom thinks this is the end of the world, she doesn't know. We don't know. But what we do know is that the way to beat this, this bug is to not let it spread. And so if we can quarantine, quarantine ourselves to our spaces, we will beat this bug. And so there's no reason not to err on the safe side. Because if you underestimate it and you pass it on to somebody who's older than you, it's it's incredibly serious. Okay, let's see, we've got a couple of specific age level kind of questions. How do you explain to a five-year-old that they can't have play dates for some time to come? How do you explain to, well, you say it just in those same simple terms we did at the beginning. There's a virus out there that, that is spread when people cough and sneeze and breathe and touch each other. And, and, we can't be doing that with other kids now um, because it's it's just not healthy or safe. Okay, how about ideas on what to tell an eight-year-old who has been begging and working toward earning a big birthday party? That's tough. Um, uh, you can talk about how this is an opportunity to problem solve. Problem solve is a great way to be organized thinkers. And, um, and you're going to say, here's the situation. The situation is this. You want to have that and say, what can we do? 
don't try to solve the problem for him uh, or her. Talk about the situation and what the limits are and let them try to solve the problem. Maybe we can do a little part with our family now. And we can bake a cake and we can make our own pinatas and do whatever we're going to do. Um, and then when this is all done, we can have a special summer party. Uh, you, um, but you want your child to be at eight years old as much involved in that problem solving process as possible. One, because they're more likely to buy into it, but two, learning how to solve problems is a great life skill. Okay, this sounds like a real world problem for all of us, but my daughter has Down syndrome. She is six years old, and I'm really worried about her regressing while away from school. I am not getting much done with her at home. I guess um, they're asking so for this, ideas. This is, it's, it's going to be hard for me to answer that question because I'm sure there's so many complexities in your life that, uh, that it's hard for me without understanding them to be able to answer specifically. Um, I guess the things that I would say is that, first of all, child comes first, but I know it sounds like you have a job and you got to get some of those things done. If it's just the two of you at home, you're going to have to find activities that can occupy your child. And if your child is, I think you said six or seven, means developmentally they might be like a three-year-old or a four-year-old. You got to find activities for three and four-year-olds. And there's all kinds of internet searches that you can do for developmentally appropriate three and four year old activities, whether it's puzzle or whether it's play doh or whether it's art in line up after an hour. I like to I like to think of um, zones in my house. I want parents to think about what are about eight different zones that I can have and rotate my kids when they're little from one to the next. So whether that zone might be this is where your stuffed animals are and the next zone is this is where the balls are and the next zone is this is where we eat. And the next zone is, you know, these are the pads you roll around on. This is where you build a fort and, and have that in your rotation so you can move your child from zone to zone to zone and keep them occupied as much as possible. As far as regression goes, um, the, there's learning things that you can be doing and supporting your child. I'm sure you've watched therapies. I'm sure you've watched what, what the school is doing. I would suspect you can get in touch with an, one of your occupational therapists or other people that have worked and give you home exercises and home activities. So I understand the concern. And um, just from a political standpoint, there is a, um, a uh, legislation right now where they're talking about as part of their emergency COVID uh, plan to remove the boundaries for special education during this emergency period which would mean that kids with special needs have less access. So you may want to, for those of you that are politically minded, go and look that up and call your senators and let them know that um, that may not, they, that may not be in your family. What's next? Cutting out just a tiny bit. Um, let's switch to the other end of the age spectrum. What are some activities for higher functioning young adults who are used to be who are used to working or being in an internship part time? Uh, ideas besides the computer should they be on a schedule too? So absolutely a schedule. Um, the uh, this is tricky because uh, you know my kids are are many of my kids are that age now. I have five, um, so I've got kids fourteen to twenty four and. Uh, some of them are going to be planning on coming home from college and, and, and getting jobs, but there's no place that is interested in hiring right now or thinking about hiring because there's so much uncertainty. So these kids are going to be around and we've got to give them things to do. Um, and so making out the schedule, again, we're going to do some uh, helping out. We're going to do, I mean, we're going to do a certain amount of yard work or we're going to do a certain amount of work in the house and get a certain amount of things done. Um, to support the family because it's difficult to run a house. We can also be spending time making plans, plans about things we're going to do this summer or we want to accomplish um, and, and working out goals and then doing some learning. And maybe it's the opportunity to learn a musical instrument or to learn um, a new skill that they haven't done uh, so that they can 
uh, be productive. But absolutely, schedules are good for all of us. I don't, it doesn't matter if you're 18 or if you're 81, schedules are helpful. Here's a follow-up question on schedules. Is there a website with ideas for schedules for kids? Or where do you find so, so for young kids, um, for young kids, there's an app I like called Brilli.com, B-R-I-L-I.com. It's fun and it's it's not necessary, but it's a fun way to pointify um, the moving through their, their goals independently throughout the day. Um, and it's a really well-designed, cute app, um, but it's something you have to pay for. Uh, my book, Raising an Organized Child, we talk about schedules and we talk about routines and mini routines. We talk about ways to, to break even the simplest task, like things you do in the bathroom, things you do before you walk out the door, things you do at the kitchen table, uh, down into little steps so that uh, people can learn to be as organized as possible and independent with their own organization. Okay, how about some things about learning at home? So here's kind of a longer one. What do you think is a realistic plan moving forward regarding learning and public education from now until June? And do you think this could initiate a shift in person-to-person -person format of school to a more digital form? And if so, what would that would that mean more anxiety? Um, so this is this is a philosophical question, one that certainly must know the uh, there's pros and cons for this kind of digital education. Um, clearly, there um, clearly some kids really have difficulty sitting still and listening to people talk. And, and some of those kids may have more difficulty. In other ways, it can be pretty darn efficient. It can be a much more cost-effective cost way to deliver education. Um, you can have quick little sessions and, and have kids go off and do their own research and learning. So as kids get older, it's a, it's a better and better opportunity. I wonder how the teachers of second graders are going to do it because it is tricky. And I also know that there's dilemmas in terms of access to appropriate internet um, and and the devices that they need to do this ongoing learning. It's it's great if you live in some of the more affluent communities, but in some of the, the less affluent communities, there's, there's less opportunity. So when the public schools are trying to do things that are fair and equitable, they have to figure out a way to educate all people. And I, I don't think there's a clear answer. Do I think there'll be a change? I think a lot of people will learn that they can learn on their own. Um, and, and I, as I watch my children grow up, that ability to teach yourself something is incredibly valuable because as opposed to when I was a kid, everything is available on the internet. You can learn to change the muffler in your car and you can learn to fix your dishwasher and you can learn to you know, build a house. It's all there. And uh, so I think this is going to give kids the opportunity to explore a different way of thinking. And for some, it'll be great. And for some, it won't be great. Um, going back to, you were talking about the app for scheduling. You were cutting out a little bit and somebody asked for you to repeat what that app was. Really, Brilli, B-R-I-L-I, Brilli.com, Brilli.com. B as in boy, B-R-I-L-I. -I. Yep, B as in boy, R-I-L-I. -I. Okay, great. Uh, let's see. How about, how do you manage multiple young children learning at different grade levels all in the same space? Should they be able to do their work in the same space? It really depends on your children. Every family is different, right? You know that um, uh, how your children work. Uh, so I, it's hard to say should. There are some six, eight, and 10-year-olds that just get super excited when they sit in the same room together, and that's not going to work that way. If so, then you can um, rotate the learning with them, or you can give them all separate spaces. You can put blinders up, little cubbies, three-sided cubbies, so they're not looking at each other and giggling the whole time. Um, they, you have to know your kids. But some kids certainly could sit in the room and get work done, and, and that's how their family, their family gets along, and it just depends on your children. Okay. Um, good to hear that sleep is important. Is it okay that my severely uh, development developmentally disabled 20 year old is sleeping until noon every day. When he is awake, he is walking, doing chores and doing some behavioral therapy at home. 
Um, it's always tricky when we say, is it okay? Because there's this line between what is functional and, um, and what, is, uh, what is right? Um, uh, or what is not necessarily what is, what is most functional? Um, and, uh, and if you feel like your child is productive during their waking times, and safe in their unsupervised times, because I'm sure you're going to bed before your child is, um, then it's okay. If your goal is for your child to be a functional part of our society, most of our society runs from eight to five. And, and if your child is sleeping through half of that, it's gonna be harder for that child to integrate into society. Um, I stay away from right and wrong, but I. I I talk about what works. You know, if your child is 20 and they're doing all their need tos, they're taking care of their health and their hygiene and their homework and their household chores, depending on how developmentally delayed your child is, I'm less concerned about the sleep time. And quality, not the oh, you're quality sleep. That. Say, repeat that one. Sorry. I, I'm less concerned about the sleep time if your child is doing their need tos and they're getting consistent quality sleep. Uh, as opposed to inconsistent quality sleep. Some days they sleep till noon. Some days they sleep till eight. Sometimes they they go to bed at two a.m. Sometimes they go to bed at ten p.m. That isn't really great for a brain. Okay. Um, okay. Here's one. What do you do if you are quarantined at home with your kids and elderly mother, but your husband keeps going to work in the office? How do you keep everyone safe? Well, the reality is some people have to go to work and there's a um, a continuum on the safety levels of each of those works. So if, if people come to my office right now, hardly anybody's in there. It's probably really safe. Um, if, if, if people are going to a hospital and they're working in a hospital, there's a lot of germs there. And, and so first of all, be realistic on what the risk is. Because, again, my office right now is much more safe. I'm seeing, I'm seeing most of my patients on, on the internet just like this. Um, uh, be, be realistic about what's safe. Uh, the second thing is, for those people who are working in less safe situations, they need to be mindful. They need to be washing their hands all the time. They, they can have their hand sanitizer available. When they get in the, they can wear a jacket when they're at work, and when they get in their car, they take their jacket off, and they come home, and they change their clothes, and they take a shower. There's things that you can do to protect your family, um, depending on on what the risk is uh, at your work. Okay, let's see. How about um, is it safe to restart ABA sessions in the home for a four and a half year old? So. Let's demystify. Well, first of all, are we restarting ABA sessions with a provider? Houses? If so, that doesn't excite me. If what we're if what we're doing is the parents are doing the ABA in the place of the ABA provider, oh, great idea. Especially because those ABA providers probably are available to give you guidance and suggestions over the internet on what you can be doing, and and supporting your child. Um, there is a great website called autismnavigator.com, autismnavigator.com, that shows videos of how parents can interact with their children and what it looks like to interact with a typically developing child and with a child with different degrees of autism. And I think that's a great, it's a great opportunity for, for um, parents to get a sense of how powerful they can be in their child's autism development. Okay. What medications do you recommend for a young autistic man who is aggressive and destructive? Having him cooped up is exacerbating his severe behaviors. So um, try not to keep him cooped up if you can. If you have the opportunity, if you're in a community where you can get out and walk and you can ride a bike or you can exercise or do something like that, spend as much time as you can doing that. You have a mini trampoline in your house that he can jump up and down on and he's willing to do that do it. Find ways to get some of that exercise in. Um, get him off his computer when you can and schedule that day and keep this guy engaged and active. Um, if 
uh, the behaviors are escalating and your, your child has a physician, contact your physician about whether medications need to be adjusted. Because you're, when, they're, when we're under times of stress, it's not unusual to adjust time medicine slightly um, during that stress, but don't adjust it yourself. Talk to your physician. Another one about autism. My children are severely autistic and don't understand a thing about what's going on. Uh, they are constantly putting things in their mouths. It is unstoppable advice. Well, if they're in your house and they're separated from people, they're safe. You're not going to catch the virus from things in your mouth. But those aren't the kids to be taking out into the community because um, they are more at risk. Uh, they, they, you know, if you could take them for walks, there's probably not a whole lot they're going to put into their mouth. But if you're at a play pot place, if you're at the sandbox, if you're, there's going to be things that they can put in their mouth that's unsafe. So you're going to have to, and it's going to be difficult, but you're going to have to keep them at home where you know what the germ risk is and it's very low. Okay. We have a lot of questions and we've got about seven more minutes. So I am going to try, I'm not going to be able to answer everybody's questions, but I'm going to get, try to get to the ones that are most general. Um, do you have any advice for a single parent who has to work from home? It's been a rough week trying to, trying to structure the week with and connect with a six-year-old. Well, I think that is a really difficult situation. It's one that people all around the country are having to deal with. You're, you're not alone in this. I, I, um, I can't tell you the answer for your family, but I can give some suggestions. Um, one is that uh, uh, you want to, like I said earlier, you want to sync your schedules as best you can so that there's quiet time built in the day where you're going to be able to get work done. You can include in your schedule, when is it time to play with mommy? When is it time to ask questions uh, so that your child is reassured? And I'd make a big visual schedule and make it really clear that your child knows when they can, they can access you and when they can't. Um, some people at work are able to reduce their hours a little bit. Uh, I understand, and parents helping parents, people can probably talk to you more about this than I can, but there's, there's benefits available for unemployment benefits for people who've had to reduce their hours because of, of this virus. So get the help that you need. And, and if you have questions about that, call Parents Helping Parents. Okay. Um, can you give us some warning signs on PTS, of PTSD for children? As, as related to this coronavirus? Or, well, so, they, so signs of PTSD, let's just talk about that in general. I'm not sure if it necessarily um, fits this situation because um, uh, at this point, unless they know people that are dying or unless uh, the situation is unusually stressful, they're just not at school. It's not, it's not a major trauma uh, for most kids. Um, but PTSD is people that aren't sleeping right, uh, people who are... Uh, extra emotional at unexpected things, people that are triggered by certain memories or thoughts or, or things that they've experienced. Um, if you see those kind of things going on, then, then we, we think your anxiety is more than just anxiety. Well, children with high anxiety, how do you convey the seriousness of the situation without inducing anxiety? You be truthful and you be honest you don't expose them to unnecessary information. So talking about death counts every day is not what you want to talk about. But um, focus on the positive things that the community is doing to keep everybody safe and to know that children are safe and, and they're going to be okay. And if they're worried about, if they're, when kids get to be eight, nine, 10, then they start worrying about their parents and, adults, and they start talking to you about death and those kind of things. That's pretty normal for an eight, nine, 10 year old. Um, if they're at that age, then talk about what you're doing to protect yourself and what grandma is doing at her house to be safe. Okay. Let's see. Any, any suggestions for young adults with special needs to keep them focused and out of a cycle of depression when they don't want to do anything and don't have many friends to connect with during this time and don't want input from their parents? Um, uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> there's a there's a lot in there. Um, in in 
in uh, basic terms, I would say, uh, just keeping it as simple as we can for this, this format, um, set the expectations about what needs to happen and then give them lots of control on how it's going to happen. Let them set their schedule. Let them set their, their, um, you know, their, their, how much feedback they want from you. Um, but, but show them real clearly, this is, this is where the expectation needs to be. And I think you said ADHD and developmental. And if that's the case, remember what's age appropriate. If they're 14 and they've got the abilities of a six or seven year old, you have to think back about what is appropriate for a six or seven year old and set those expectations. Okay, it is recommended, is it recommended to give my son his ADHD medications every day when he's not going to school? So ADHD doesn't go away when, when you're out of school and, um, and learning happens all the time. And uh, so the general practice is for people to take their medicine regularly uh, and not stop. Is it unsafe to stop the medicine? Uh, most of the medicines are in and out of your system every day. There's a couple of the, the medicines, the attention medicines that take a while to build up. And so if you stop it, it's going to take a while to build up. Uh, Stratera is one that comes to mind. So you should ask your physician before you make any changes in your medication routine. Um, but don't fool yourself that stopping the medicine is necessarily healthier or safer uh, than, than um, taking the medicine every day because there's no evidence that says that's true. Okay, let's see. I'm concerned Dr. Korb is referencing summer in a few weeks. Schools will be closed at least through summertime. I hear estimates of 18 months for dealing with this in general. Therefore, I think we should be cautious about sounding too much like things will be back to normal by summer. Thoughts? Well, I think the reality is we don't know. But we do know in Italy, um, when and, and again, I would I would defer to the infectious disease experts on this topic before you you. Uh, so I'm going to talk in general terms. But what we know is when they put these quarantines in place in Italy for the last three days, we haven't seen the numbers increase. We've seen them kind of plateau. Um, we saw that China has made tremendous uh, gains by quarantining and blocking off uh, cities, and and so uh, there's every reason to believe that this is manageable if we're all responsible and safe, but we don't know how responsible and safe people are gonna be. There's information we don't know. Um, and, and so when I'm saying the summer, what we do know is that we need to be quarantined for the next few weeks and, and then we'll have to see and we'll have to adjust if, if things change. If you have a question about your child's education and um, you know, how to think about this online learning situation, you can certainly call PHP. We are still open. Our education specialists are still willing to, um, you know, do some uh, troubleshooting and thought process with you. If you have mental health concerns, NAMI's hotline is still open. You can call them. They have people who are manning that and can help you with um, if you have situations that are escalating beyond your control. Anything else you want to say, Dr. Corb, in, in ending? And thank you so much. This was so helpful. You just have a great way of distilling things into. Uh, the words that we can all understand. Thank you. I, I appreciate everybody taking time this evening and, and, um, and uh, looking out for their kids. And just remember, organization and structure brings peace of mind to your children. Great. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to end. Thank you. Bye-bye. Be safe and sane. <laughs>